Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London. I'm really delighted today to have the opportunity to talk to Professor Peter Woodruff, who's Professor of Psychiatry and Head of Department at, the, at Sheffield University. Um, and Professor Woodruff is joining me here at the annual Congress of the Royal College of Psychiatrists here in the Barbican, but has been presenting his research on auditory hallucinations and other aspects of psychiatric disorder at various other conferences recently. Peter, could you tell us a bit more about your recent findings in auditory hallucinations? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, we start from the premise that uh, auditory hallucinations are heard experiences, so they're perceptions rather than disorders of inner thinking or uh, inner thought, uh, uh, because this is what patients tell us they suffer from. They hear voices, uh, they don't think voices, and so we approach our research to try and disentangle the component processes in the auditory system that might go awry and lead to the experience of hearing voices, which for most patients uh, are extremely distressing and a significant cause of suicide. So uh, we use uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging as a way of um, identifying uh, functional activity within the auditory cortex. And uh, going back a number of years, uh, some of the early work we did uh, showed that when you hallucinate, you activate areas of auditory cortex, and uh, so you engage the auditory cortex as part of that experience. But then if you uh, present uh, external speech in the scanner, the uh, ability of the auditory cortex to respond to that external speech diminishes if you're in a hallucinatory state. So in other words, the uh, auditory cortex has a sort of capacity, a maximum capacity to respond to the signal, whether that signal is coming from the auditory sort of hallucination source or whether it's coming from external to the head. In the, in the form of external speech. So uh, we uh, proposed a number of years ago this saturation hypothesis, which means that if, uh, if you present external speech in someone who's hallucinating, uh, their response, their ability to respond to that is less than when they're not hallucinating. Uh, so there's a kind of a, a negative feedback between the, uh, the ability of the auditory cortex to respond to external speech or the hallucinatory signal. The more the external speech, the less it can respond to the hallucinatory signal and vice versa. And indeed, this, this is consistent with what patients tell us because they find that if they listen to music or speech through headphones, it uh, helps reduce the experience of hallucinations. Uh, and we've done a number of studies uh, in healthy volunteers as well to try and disentangle the component processes that, to, that lead to how you hear uh, real voices. Uh, and of course, we automatically know that we're hearing uh, a male or female voice or a familiar voice, and we know where from outside the, the, the brain the voice comes from. And all these things are, are computed uh, fairly automatically in the auditory system. <clears throat> so how is it then that an internal signal can generate what is perceived to be a real voice in external space? Uh, so we've done a number of neuroimaging studies to try and, for instance, understand uh, why you hear male versus female voices. And here, um, studies have shown that uh, when you when you're in a psychotic state and you're hearing voices, you tend to hear male voices rather than female voices. So why is that? Uh, and we've shown that uh, in health, uh, a, a female voice activates the auditory cortex more readily than a male voice, and that's taking into account any differences in uh, tone or pitch, which, uh, which would be confounding factors. Uh, and so female voices are more easily picked up by the auditory cortex. So we propose that if you're generating uh, a voice from a low baseline, uh, 
you reach the threshold at which you perceive a male voice earlier than you would to perceive a female voice, which may explain perhaps why uh, the hallucinated voices tend to be more male than female. So that's one uh, sort of aspect of this. And another is, uh, is the externality of speech. Where, how is it that the brain is able to locate voices outside the head? And this goes back to the old sort of Jasper's idea that uh, you could dis differentiate pseudo-hallucinations, which come from inside the head, supposedly, and true hallucinations, which come from outside the head. And we've done functional MR uh, experiments to show that uh, the, the areas that seem to be responsible for enabling you to locate voices outside the head versus inside the head uh, are in an area called the planum temporale. And this is an area of the auditory cortex that is strongly activated during the actual experience of auditory hallucinations. And we think that uh, this activation is sort of giving externality to the perceived speech. And that's why auditory hallucinations are perceived outside the head, even though the actual signal that drives that is coming from inside the head. So there are, by, by looking at these sort of component processes in detail, we're able to sort of build up a model of uh, how the auditory system might go wrong and uh, lead to these sorts of experiences. And once we build this up, uh, we can, we're then in a better position of understanding the mechanisms and the pathophysiology and uh, develop potentially better treatments uh, such as um, external stimulation with uh, techniques like transcranial magnetic stimulation or, or transcranial um, direct current stimulation. Uh, and also it helps us understand uh, clinical interventions uh, and, and psychological interventions that might help uh, patients um, attend to uh, more adaptive signals uh, which uh, would otherwise compete with the hallucinatory experience and uh, enable them to, to be less distracted and less distressed by them and perhaps attend to auditory features of the environment that are more adaptive and more helpful for them. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, it's not just the auditory system itself that's driving these from a sort of, almost a sort of bottom-up system, there's also a top-down system which involves attention and uh, attention is a very important um, sort of modulator of the auditory system. So if you attend to a particular auditory feature, uh, you will tend therefore to activate uh, a component process in the auditory system more readily than if you don't attend to it. Uh, and indeed this is borne out with uh, neuroimaging studies that show that if you attend to certain auditory features, you will activate those um, systems in the auditory cortex more readily. So there's a, an attentional network that's important in actually modifying uh, the auditory signal that uh, leads to the experience of hallucinations as well as normal speech. Um, and uh, to take this further forward, uh, we've, uh, we've more recently looked at this idea of uh, how you might um, sense tranquil states. And of course, we try therapeutically to um, encourage uh, tranquil mental states, uh, which of course is why traditionally we used to call uh, the antipsychotics we gave patients tranquilizers. And uh, uh, so that sort of made us think as to what might uh, be helpful for people uh, to attend to in the environment. And so we did a, we did a functional imaging experiment where we uh, presented people with an identical auditory sound, but in one condition they heard that sound in the context of a tranquil visual scene, uh, for instance, waves um, crashing on a beach. Uh, 
and in another condition it was a non-tranquil scene such as motorway traffic. Uh, so they were hearing the identical input in both conditions. The only thing was that in one condition they were seeing a tranquil scene and in the other they weren't. And indeed we found that despite there being an identical auditory input in both conditions, the auditory cortex behaved differently depending on whether the person was seeing the tranquil scene or the non-tranquil scene. And, and the, the auditory cortex seemed to be more connected dynamically to systems in the brain that might be uh, considered part of a, a proposed tranquility network uh, when they were, th these signals were heard in the context of seeing the tranquil scene as opposed to the non-tranquil scene. So you've been doing a large amount of sort of progressive um, investigations using brain scanning and other techniques into auditory hallucinations. What in the journey you've been on has been the most surprising finding in your view? Well, I think in the early days it was quite a novel idea to think that the auditory system might actually be abnormal in people who were hallucinating because uh, the current uh, sort of wisdom was that this was uh, an inner speech model of hallucinations. Um, and also this idea that if you gave external speech, you would somehow um, get a different response uh, in hallucinators versus non-hallucinators. So that was, that was quite novel at the time. But also I think the idea that... Um, despite controlling for all the potential differences between male and female speech, uh, there is actually a different response to male and female voices, which uh, in a sense is surprising because um, uh, uh, you, know, you would have thought it's to do with pitch and, 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 and rather sort of uh, simpler aspects of speech, but clearly evolutionarily we have evolved to pick up these differences between gender at quite a, uh, quite a sort of uh, a level of neuronal function which is uh, well established in, 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 in people's brains. So it sounds like, from what you're saying, uh, that the brain is more attuned to the female voice, is that right, in terms yes. of auditory cortex? Yeah. Does that have anything to do with child rearing, babies, a baby's brain developing and therefore historically women were more often looking after children, or is there any other theories as to what that's about? Well, I think there are a number of theories uh, about that, and of course that would be, a, that would be a, a, a reasonable hypothesis, and I think there is some evidence for that. Uh, not neuroimaging evidence, but, uh, but other sort of uh, uh, psychological evidence. Um, and... Uh, Indeed, it, it, I think this sort of approach uh, and these findings has influenced uh, why we use on public announcement systems, why the female voice is used uh, more commonly, because it is picked up more readily, and that's whether or not you're a male or female listener, you still pick up the female voice more readily. I still don't quite understand why that means auditory hallucinations tend to be male voices. I don't quite understand... Um, th th that point you were making about that explains it's something to do with the threshold. Yes. Um, that at a lower threshold, uh, if it's a male voice, it's more likely to be picked up as a, as a hallucination. Could well, you say a bit more about that? Yes, sure. I mean, because uh, the, the experiments where we, where we found the female voice activates more readily, uh, that's when you're presenting an external source of voices. Uh, but if you're thinking that you, you've got to generate a voice without any external input. Oh, I see. The uh, brain activity. The, 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 the amount it. of energy you require to get to okay. a threshold at which you generate a voice would be lower to generate a male voice than it would to generate ah. a female voice. Okay. Which, which explains, perhaps, at least neuroscientifically, it explains uh, why uh, most patients... Uh, from the studies that have been done, uh, experience 
hallucinations as male voices rather than female voices. Do you think you've got any clues? I know we're running out of time, so one final question. Do, do you think you have any clues from your work as to what's likely to prove the best treatments for auditory hallucinations? In particular, do you think they're going to be specific treatments for auditory hallucinations as opposed to just general treatments for psychosis? And d- does your research suggest there may be treatments outside pharmacology um, that, that will come along? Yes, I think it does, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, more uh, specific and directed use of external stimulation techniques like transcranial magnetic stimulation, I think, uh, is is a possibility. Um, And indeed, there have been treatment trials using these techniques. Um, And I think one of the reasons why um, some patients do definitely improve with them and others don't and a a few uh, seem to get worse is because uh, we haven't quite specifically defined how that external stimulation affects these component uh, dynamic processes and so I think uh, doing further studies on detailed phenomenology, clinical phenomenology uh, and um, uh, imaging uh, with uh, treatment trials uh, is is warranted to try and disentangle that complex issue. So I'm going to ask you a very unfair question now, but suppose someone is listening to this who has either got fed up with medication, is having auditory hallucinations, wants some kind of other approach to it, but has found that previous treatments, particularly of a pharmacological kind, haven't worked for them or they don't want to take the medication for various reasons. Can you give any advice or tips that might help them uh, cope with auditory hallucinations based on your work? Well, I think, uh, I th- I think there is a useful uh, approach uh, to try and uh, modify uh, your attentional system. So that, and this is something that people could be helped and, and receive some training in, uh, it's a matter of, of attending to things that are, uh, are helpful and adaptive, which will have the effect through this top-down system of actually dampening down the hallucinations and also help, uh, hopefully, the ability to detect uh, useful signals from the environment from noisy signals which uh, are less helpful. So another way of putting that would be they should distract themselves by listening to other things, particularly when the hallucination comes on. Well, distraction is one way, but I'm also thinking of more focused attention on, uh, on um, signals that they really want to pick up because you know, clearly you know, it may be difficult to hear useful conversations if you're distracted by hallucinations. So, so absorption and engagement with, yes. with particular aspects of the environment yes. would be a key solution. Then. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay. Professor Peter Woodruff, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.